This is kind of a lose talk, actually, because I'm sitting here with a bunch of people who are good at atherectomy. If you know atherectomy here, you're not going to learn anything new. And if you don't know atherectomy, you're not going to go out and do atherectomy because you listen to this talk. But still, nonetheless. Maybe. Maybe they should. You know, a third <laughs> you of hospitals. go and do it. You won't be prepared to do yeah. it. But, you know, a third of hospitals in the U.S. don't do any atherectomy. So there's clearly a need. Yeah. Um, so, what ha we're going to be talking a little bit uh, about restenosis at the end of the talk, but we'll be mainly focusing on calcification. And why is this a problem? Those of you who have struggled with uh, calcified tortuous arteries know that stent delivery, uh, and then those of you who've fallen into the trap of, of stenting an unprepared vessel and left with underexpansion have known uh, and seen decreased uh, stent expansion, increased malaposition, asymmetric uh, deployments. Uh, there's more procedural complications, as was said earlier, edge dissections, perforations. And then obviously, if you're leaving underexpanded stents, uh, early stent thrombosis, and then late uh, uh, restenosis. So I, I think as is now becoming something that we pay much more attention to uh, is uh, plaque modification. Well. Wow. Jeez, uh, and, and lumen expansion. I guess I'm never going to be able to read that slide and I have to skip through. But we want to prepare the vessel and we want to make sure that our stents are going to expand. And back in the day, we used to say, well, I don't really need to image. Uh, we'll just deploy at high pressure and whatever it is, it is. And I think that's kind of a failed strategy at this point, especially when we're dealing uh, with these terrible vessels, or we are dealing with restenosis. I think at this point, I've come around to the idea that we need to do a better job and understand uh, at the index procedure how to do a good job so that we're not coming back and having to deal with second and third layers of stents. So just as kind of a general algorithm for how to approach a calcified lesion, remember when you discuss these cases with each other, it's either going to be let's rota up front, or do CSI up front, or do laser up front, or do we see what balloons are like? And I think that are the, those are the two dominant strategies. And then another strategy where you see the dotted line is let's image and make a decision based on that. And I think that's an accumulating uh, or, or increasingly frequent strategy because uh, we can actually see the artery pretty well and quantify how much calcium. With IBIS, it's a little less easy to see how thick the uh, calcium plaque is, how long it is, because it leads to shadowing. You can see uh, the calcium leads to shadowing. So you can see in the IVIS pictures here of a calcified artery that there's dropout on the other side of, uh, of the calcification. Whereas with OCT, you can actually see the calcium quite well. You see that it, its thickness, and there's some general guidelines of what's really a thick uh, calcified portion of the plaque, how much circum circumference you might see. So that initial strategy of this is so uh, high calcium burden, we're going we're gonna to do atherectomy up front versus let's inflate a balloon, see if it expands, can now actually be added uh, another strategy of let's image and decide whether we cross over to initial uh, 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 plaque modification or do we go with a non-atherectomy strategy. So, uh, as I mentioned, we may try with uh, scoring balloons or NC balloons at high pressure, but if you're going to go uh, with treatment of calcification, I think your two main modalities are going to be rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy. Just to go back to the future, uh, 19, uh, uh, what is it now, 25 years of Rhoda and we're still learning. Uh, is that, am I quoting a Marvel movie somehow? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, we, you see the, uh, the diamond coated burr, 125 to 2.5 millimeter burr on the front end, uh, diamond coated. Uh, the drive shaft, uh, the OD of the uh, sheath is 4.3 French. Uh, you see, I just want to draw your attention, the shape of the 125 burr is a little bit different then the shape of the 1.5 burr is shaped more like a watermelon seed. So it theoretically has a little more chance of going through the plaque and then not being able to, to come back uh, and burr entrapment. So you'll see the most commonly used uh, burrs are probably the 1.5 or slightly bigger. So the principle of how Rota works is, is kind of how uh, those of you who've had cast or broken your arm and had the cast cut off why it doesn't cut your skin is when there's elastic uh, tissue, 
it, it moves along it, but when it's inelastic, it cuts. And it actually, the orthogonal displacement of friction uh, leads to uh, the force being perpendicular to the plane of the initial direction. I didn't, you know, that sounds, that doesn't make any sense to me when I just say those words. So I put these two pictures in to explain how turning uh, allows a reduction in uh, friction. So uh, into a few tips about technique. Uh, it used to be that uh, rotational atherectomy was done at very high burr speeds. And that was because people really wanted to drill the plaques done with very big burrs, with very long runs. And that was leading to more complications, more specifically no reflow and dissection of the arteries. So um, slow burr speeds, I usually actually set it at 150, 160. Uh, slow, slow ablation runs, I stay under 30 seconds. Avoid decelerations greater than 5,000. I think this is kind of when we say to the fellows, be careful. Uh, I mean, you, you try not to have decelerations, but they exist. Um, so usually a seven French guide, uh, you know, if you're dealing with something that's tortuous and calcified, uh, you're gonna be probably having trouble with delivery. Uh, somebody that's facile with uh, holding and, and uh, moving the wires is, is helpful. Uh, transvenous pacing, I'll maybe take a quick poll from the uh, panelists who uses pacing uh, routinely, right coronary and circumflex, dominant circ. Switch to aminophilin for most of my case. Aminophilin, pervase. Pacing only if it's a very hyperdominant with a large, lot of calcium burden. Otherwise. So I made it up, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't routinely, yeah, yeah, I mean I agree with that. I think we've gone away from that. Uh, know their LV function will transiently get worse, use heparin. Here's a, uh, the pacing question, uh, retrospective analysis. Uh, only around 4%, 10% of people are gonna end up needing to be paced. And remember also too, the vast majority of these people when they do get bradycardic, you can ride it out or give them some atropine and it really only lasts a few seconds. Now if somebody is very compromised, their ventricular function is poor, you might uh, be a little more apt to either give imenophilin or pace them. So you guys talked about guide alignment for entry and actually delivery of the stents. It's actually just as important for rota and the entry of the burr. If you're not coaxial with the catheter when you're having the burr enter the artery, you have the chance of damaging the ostium, perforating, and causing trouble. I use the floppy wire unless uh, the burr won't engage or there's, um, or you want to have a kind of deep cut in the artery, in which case you may use the extra support wire. But I really can't remember the last time I used Rota extra support. Um, I usually, I, you know, I'm not good enough to be confident that I can wire with the Rota wire, so I've, uh, I cross with whatever I want to cross with, and then I use microcatheters uh, uh, to exchange for the Rota wire, having an algorithm for the kind of the balloon uncrossable, microcatheter uncrossable uh, lesion. As I mentioned, almost use, always use the 1.5 burr, 175 for heavy calcium in a focal but not super tight lesion. Uh, if the burr doesn't cross or it's kind of a total occlusion where I'm not entirely certain of uh, the size of the vessel, 125, severe angulation or tor tortuosity downsize. There's a general rule, I remember it is actually on the boards, uh, to not oversize the burr. Uh, more than kind of 0.8, but then again, I don't know whether I got it right or not. <laughs> uh, so uh, repeat the, the, the burr passage until there are no decelerations, uh, and you know, these polishing runs, I think, uh, also allow uh, people to get more experience with how to move the burr in a, in a careful, uh, directed fashion. Uh, puffs to assess flow. Be prepared to deal with spasms, slow flow, perforations, bradycardia. I'm gonna show you a couple videos of the old Rota. See if this plays here. This is the one person Rota uh, technique where uh, the break is inside the burr. Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the torquing device is inside the burr defeating the, uh, uh, the break. And on Dynaglide, you can just advance. Now, if you actually put the burr in, put the thing in properly, it'll work. So here, I'm fixing that. Oops. And uh, and then with, on Dynaglide, the uh, loss of friction allows you to just advance the rota burr in without the wire moving. And you see that the wire, their loop becomes uh, bigger as you advance it in.
and that's actually pretty easy. And here it is on the way out. Same thing. And you see this the loop becomes smaller, the wire is not moved. And then are you, are you doing time. that under fluoro or are you watching it? Uh, I am doing it under fluoro just because I'm paranoid, but you know, it, it's <laughs> supposed to not move. So <laughs> You know, it took me like I, I didn't know what like, your faith level in, in yeah, the approach was. it's it's pretty faithful, but uh, <laughs> not enough that I don't do it on floor. It took me like a year to not floor for CTOs, so <laughs> the trap balloon. Okay. Um, all right, I kind of stuck here. Okay, uh, and then the orbital atherectomy. This is the system here. Uh, this is now a crown of one size that orbits. Uh, and, and leads to uh, a cutting in a different manner rather than rotational atherectomy. The compare and contrast here are the, uh, the size matrix as well as the wire. There's bi-directional sanding in a 360 degree orbit rather than centered on the wire. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but uh, the key to, to orbital atherectomy is the advancement of the burr is much slower and deliberate and the action is in repeat burr runs. So the more runs you do, the larger the lumen you get, the slower you go, the better lumen you get and the more ablation you get. And so it's not necessarily obligatory to go to as uh, at 120,000, you can do repeated runs at 80 in a very slow, deliberate fashion, and, and that's how it works. One uh, you know, theoretical advantage, and I think this was talked about earlier, is that when you look at rota on the left, you are biased against a curve by the wire, and you're advancing over the wire centered on the wire. Whereas in orbital atherectomy, uh, that bias is, is a little less uh, accentuated. Okay, last minute or two. I'm gonna talk about stent under expansion and malapposition, which is where I mainly use laser. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I generally use either orbital or rotational atherectomy for calcium. But when I wanna expand an under-expanded stent, uh, I tend to use uh, laser. So it's defined as MLA less than 70% uh, compared to the reference. It's present in about uh, a third of cases. This is a, a slide from uh, Kevin Croach at the Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital. So uh, your choices are laser atherectomy, which vaporizes tissue, uh, debulks the neointima, uh, or rotational atherectomy. Um, you know, we generally want to stay away from rotational atherectomy for newer stents. Uh, or stents where we think that they may not uh, actually be completely endothelialized. Um, but uh, very tight lesions, it may be difficult to deliver the uh, atherectomy, uh, the laser atherectomy catheter. There are three main uh, methods that laser uh, deals with the tissue. That's photothermal, photochemical, and photomechanical. Uh, so, uh, you know, initially, we only thought that there was this uh, vapor bubble that actually ablated the tissue, but there's also uh, kind of uh, now an understanding of photomechanical uh, effect that actually works outside of the stent to help with under expansion, uh, as well as uh, not only the rupture of the cells based on uh, the photothermal uh, effect. So use heparinized saline flush to eliminate contrast from the lasing field. Uh, this uh, was discovered the hard way when uh, there were lots of perforations and dissections when laser first came out, that with contrast, there's almost a four times greater size of the, uh, the vapor bubble, and uh, depending on the type of the vessel that you're working on, that may be too big for that vessel. So advance the catheter slowly during laser admission, uh, retract the catheter, give some nitro as necessary, uh, be worried about perforations and dissections and abrupt closure. Now, you may use that phenomenon to your advantage if uh, it's a, a very resistant lesion uh, or a lesion that is not expanding with the standard techniques. You may mix in some contrast with saline uh, and you may turn up the, uh, the uh, fluency and the rate, uh, but this is you know, usually for undilatable lesions, usually stents. So in conclusion, uh, calcium is becoming more of a prevalent issue. 
in uh, the cath lab and not only for CHIP, but I think just for our regular cases, when we see calcium, we should be doing a better job so someone doesn't have to clean up our mess later because with uh, restenosis. And uh, you know, we're seeing these patients who are older with comorbidities uh, and with renal failure and such, and we want to try to just get it right the first time. Uh, Imaging, I think, is a must for, uh, for these types of cases. I don't know if the, the panelists wish to comment. Uh, and there are treatment algorithms you know, based on how much calcium, how thick the calcium is, which I didn't show you, but uh, we could go through that at another uh, session. After ne initial present preparation, uh, I would uh, take a look and prior uh, to stent implantation at the end to make sure, uh, after stent implantation, to make sure that we've done a good enough job. With that, thank you very much. I'll just ask you, uh, what about if someone is stinted over a bifurcation, what's your preferred way to manage that? Say it's a really large diagonal with a subtotal lesion that was stinted over a year ago. And also, what do you do, what's your algorithm to avoid and deal with a stuck burr? Uh, just a few things that, yeah. that might be helpful. Yep. <clears throat> so the first question of how do you deal with a, uh, a jailed side branch is uh, I don't mind actually opening up the uh, stent struts and using a small burr. You probably know it used to be uh, the standard that uh, when you stented across a bifurcation, we would finish with uh, a balloon in the side branch just in case we had to come back later for rota. Uh, or at least that's something that happened when I was a, right. a, a fellow. Now we don't do that uh, if there's normal flow and the vessel looks pretty good, but I, I don't mind actually doing that. I use a small burr, though, uh, there. So the stuck burr, stuck burr kind of algorithm is, um, is you pull back on the wire. The wire is 014, and the shaft is 019, and that weld is really strong. So you can own the burr on both sides now and uh, you can push your guide in and uh, try to pull back, and that actually usually works. Uh, if that doesn't work, there are a number of other techniques like deep seating the guide, a balloon alongside of the, uh, the uh, burr. I find that that's usually not that effective because you're burring because this was a tortuous tight lesion. You can't really deliver things. Right. You have to get another guide to, to do that kind of thing. Um, sometimes just wiring it uh, will free it up. Uh, but usually uh, a fair bit of back pull and pressure. Other people, I haven't done this, have cut the shaft and put a guide liner over it and you know, maybe a, putting a 5.5 guide liner over the shaft and really being up against it and owning it on both sides with the wire should uh, be able to pull it. I don't know if other folks have other tricks that they've used, but I haven't needed to use anything else. Yeah, I think um, those are all great tips to get your Roto out, uh, you know, for the handful of cases I've, I've reviewed, one of them was mine. It was a all one two one point two five burr, and all of them were leaning on the calcified lesion and not like pecking, just leaning, and they all they all of them got stuck. I, I, all those tricks I've tried. I think the one that's worked every single time was either cutting it, putting a guide liner, deep seating it, or deep seating your guide and pulling and hoping for the best. And this mm -hmm. actually worked every single time. Just the one thing to bring up the laser. You know, I, I found laser extremely helpful with the moderate calcified lesions, not necessarily the the um, the uh, heavy ones. But just a, a tip is so when you're, which you pointed out, you have to flush saline, and you got to make sure your guides in the in the corner when you're flushing the saline because the contrast in the blood has protein and, and they can form micro bubbles and can cause uh, damage to the vessel. So you got to make sure you flush with saline. But the one thing is you may like do, you know, 5, 10, 15 runs. Uh, give it a little bit of time in between because we learned the hard way. If you're, you know, doing a 5, 10 second run and you wait 5 seconds, you flush again with saline. Uh, we had a patient going to V-fib because it was, you know, just saline flushing continuously down the coronary that we have to pop a couple times. Turned out well, but it wasn't very pleasant for the patient. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tend to kind of wait uh, in between, let, let the patient breathe. Yeah, it's, I mean, you're generally annoyed and stressed out because it took like eight minutes for the laser to turn on, you know, <laughs> and so you're in kind of a rush. Yeah. 